Thank you, Louise. Hello, everyone, and welcome to OTF Connects. I would like to thank each of you for giving up your time uh, to join us tonight. I'm Syria Skirham, facilitator and coordinator for the OTF Professional Development Project. It's my pleasure to welcome back Cynthia Nicholson from the Critical Thinking Consortium, who will be facilitating tonight's session. Uh, Cynthia has facilitated a number of effective webinars for OTF Connects over the last year. And uh, thank you, Cynthia, and uh, welcome. Thanks, Syria. I'm, I'm really happy to be here with these dedicated people. Um, Louise, you wanted to do something more before we get started, right? That's right. I'm just going to advance the slide here. And everyone, here's our map of Ontario. We do like to keep track of where our teachers are joining us from. So if you're able to grab your text tool, and you can practice here. If your clip art tool, the very bottom tool of your tool strip, happens to be working, you can use that. But we have been having some challenges with that lately. So if you grab your text tool, and then uh, click on the map in approximately the area where you are and type the name of the town or city. If it's already there, uh, you can uh, have a go at the highlighter tool, which is the third tool from the top of the tool strip, and highlight the city you're at. Wonderful. So we've got Ottawa, Waterloo, Chatham. So we're stretched right across the, the breadth of uh, central and southern Ontario there and a little bit across to uh, eastern Ontario. Fantastic. Thank you, folks. Uh, back over to you, Cynthia. OK, thank you. And um, I was trying <laughs> to spend to type Bowen Island onto the map. So of course, it wouldn't be in Ontario. I'm over on the west coast. Um, and uh, living on a, an island that's just just out from West Vancouver. So, uh, but we do a lot of, of connecting with people across Canada. So it's it's good to be here with you guys tonight. Um, I am impressed that you're taking this time in the evening, and I want to make sure we really make good use of this time because we are such a small group. I'm I'm really I'm going to encourage you to talk on your microphone or t and to also use the chat box and the whiteboard because it's really a, I really want to hear ideas from all of us. And we're also um, using our, our workshops to model the TC squared approach, uh, which is a very interactive approach to, to learning and teaching. So I'm wondering if we can go down, and I, I'm very curious to know. I know some of you have had experience and know quite a bit about the Critical Thinking Consortium and the framework we work with, but I'm not sure about everybody. And it will make a difference as we go through how long we spend you know, kind of explaining things or not. So uh, I'm wondering, I'm not sure if everybody has a microphone that's usable. Oh, yeah, I'd love to. I, I love snow, Lisa. <laughs> I, I do miss it. I grew up in Winnipeg. So. Um, but I'm wondering if we can go down the list. If you don't have a microphone, then write in the chat book and just give me a little idea of your experience with DC squared, from none, perhaps, to you know um, quite a bit, or you've used the ideas in your classroom and so on. So Carol, can you um, see if your microphone's working? And then we'll go down the list. Yeah, I just noticed that Carol's got the little symbol there that's letting us know that she's in the audio setup right now. So Jeff, over to you. <laughs> OK, so I see Jeff has got uh, no background whatsoever with the uh, TC squared model, so that's good to know. Lisa, are you going to jump in there? Sure. Hi. Uh, thank you, Cynthia, for doing this. Um, I've been uh, at the board for the last two years uh, trying to figure out how we're going to roll some of this out uh, with our teachers. And uh, I've presently returned back to the classroom in order to um, to implement this. And uh, I'm having uh, a heck of a time. I uh, am a grade 11 biology teacher, grade 11 and 12. 
And uh, I'm really enjoying trying to implement this, and I'm certainly looking to solidify uh, whatever I'm doing. I feel uh, a little bit alone, so I'm looking for uh, feedback. And uh, I'm not at the point where I'm taking a whole lot of risks yet. I'm trying to just figure out where I integrate it. And uh, I'm going with the Garfield's model of um, taking what exists in the school presently and trying to tweak it so that it works uh, within the, the existing framework. Awesome, awesome Lisa. Thank you. Um, I, miss, I might have missed it, but what board are you with? I'm with the French Catholic uh, School Board in Ottawa. It's called the Conseil oh, Biblical Ottawa. Academy. Yes, okay, in Ottawa. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Yes, it was and, a snow um, day today, by the way, and it was a. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and Judy, I'm seeing you've written in the chat box. Um, okay, so you have some familiarity then with the with the framework, and I'm just not sure if we've heard from Carol. Carol, did you manage to get your microphone set up? Mm. No, we're still not hearing you, Carol. So if you could just type in the chat box. I'm not sure if you caught this, but I was just asking people how much experience, if any, they've had with the TC squared and the framework um, that we use. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on now. So I know we've got quite the range here. So um, oh and Judy, did we miss did we miss you? No, I read your comment in the um, oh I see what you're asking, Syria. Okay, I'm gonna move on. I probably might miss some things that are in the chat box. I find it a little hard to divide my attention. But if there's something in there that I should see um, or a question you have, uh, please use the hands up signal. Then I can, then I can stop and, and take a look. All right. Now, if I can. We've, we've pretty much done this. Um, so that's fine. We'll move along. So what these, these are the three main things I'd like to us to look at tonight. Uh, first of all, what are criteria for judgment and why are they so important? Um, also, what are some special considerations? Because within this TC squared approach, we're using these terms in a very specific way and we need to be really clear about what concepts we're attaching to them. Um, and then how do we develop these with, with students? So I'm going to get you to first of all, I know you with all that snow you don't want to think about going away anywhere, but let's just think for a little bit about a winter holiday. Possibly some of us are, have other priorities in our budgets right now and we're saving up to redo the roof on our house, not half as much fun. So what I want you to think about is when you think of possibly going on a holiday or a trip, what are some of the key factors you would consider when using a, when choosing a holiday destination? And, and let's see if we can get the, the um, whiteboard typing that you were just practicing there with Louise, if you can use it right on this space to just list some of, okay, so cost, we've got, and, and you know, don't worry about being precise or anything. Let's get as many ideas out here as we can. And if you see something that you, if you think your idea is close to another idea or connected to it in some way, you can help us by putting it in that area or moving it over to be close to it. Not sure what the black bar is that happened, Louise, do you know? I'm sorry, that's me. Um, I cannot access my word box, so I went to the next one and <laughs> I guess it was without success. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No problem. Um, Louise, any ideas? So when you're trying to click on the, uh, on the letter A, it's not letting you click on it, Lisa? Uh, it clicks, 
and then when I go on to the overhead, I get a box, but then I can't type in it. Oh, okay. All right. So in the where your capital letter A is, there should be a little tiny triangle in the bottom right corner. If you're able to click that, you should see a second text option that's just a big capital A with no uh, text box lines next to it. And that one should eliminate your box issue. Mm. Okay, I'll give that a try. Any luck? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, you can go ahead and use the chat box down there, um, and uh, and we'll keep track of things there as well. Thank you. Okay. Lisa. Thank you. Okay, we've, we're getting quite a few ideas here, and I, I'm sort of seeing that they they kind of go together. And I'm not sure somebody circled cost, and maybe that means that you also think cost is important, or maybe and and Lisa, you've listed safety and good weather there. So some of these, okay, so maybe that was Jeff. Cost is most important, but Jeff, <laughs> would it be good if you got somewhere and it was rainy and cold and um, you know, people were getting uh, mugged all the time. So we we do have some other factors too. Ah, food. We haven't got that in there yet. Um, I don't think. Okay, some maybe somewhere new. So this whole idea of uh, I think you maybe we could tie that together with um, the idea of culture or things to do. Um, or just maybe somewhere different that you haven't seen before. Language might be a consideration. Okay, I think we've got the idea here. I think we're, we're so what what the point of this is is to say to you that these key factors that you would use perhaps to do something like choose a vacation spot. This is what we're referring to in TC squared when we talk about criteria for judgment. So. Um, I just got to move the slide here. So they are in when we're using this term, this phrase with our teaching. We're talking about key factors that students consider when they're making a critically thoughtful decision. And the whole TC squared approach is setting up the classroom uh, tasks so that students are being requested or required to make critically thoughtful decisions. Now, I'm going to keep going here, but if there's anything I say that's not making sense, please let me know. So there's lots of things we can think about when we're um, talking about critical thinking. People talk about you know, recognizing bias, constructing a, a valid argument, uh, providing evidence, taking different points of view. All those things are part of being a good critical thinker. But I like this definition at the top here that's very, very condensed and pulls out three key things. That a person's thinking critically if they are judging or making choices among options in light of criteria. So it's the idea of making choices or decisions, um, having some plausible options, because if there's only just one right answer, it's very hard to set up a critical thinking task around it. But there are always criteria, and that's what we were just looking at with the with the trip idea of choices. So um, here are some things that we might choose to do when we're on these vacations. Um, I just like some thoughts from you about whether these choosing what to do. Say you had an afternoon and you're deciding what to do. Would that be based on this uh, definition up at the top? Would that be a critical thinking? exercise if you were choosing what to do from these, um, these options. And if you want to grab the mic, uh, put your hand up or just click on your mic. Or if you'd rather respond in the chat box, that would be fine too. So what, what would make this a critical thinking activity, um, 
tax activity, um, or could it be done in a, in a way that wasn't thinking critically? Is that question clear? I feel like I'm not saying it very clearly. <laughs> Um, Louise, can you give me a, or yes. Syria, are you hearing my question and is it clear? Yes, well, I heard your question, but I agree that I'm not sure if, um, if you're asking if we agree with the criteria for what uh, think criti thinking critically is, or specifically the list of items below there. Okay, well, what I'm asking is, yeah, I know I realized that if you were making this choice about what to do tomorrow morning, say, um, would that be thinking critically? Would you be thinking critically? So Judy said, said not sure. What would make it, how, if you made the cho what would make it a critical thinking, cho uh, critically thoughtful choice? What would you have to do to make it a critically thoughtful choice? This is maybe a little, a little, a little bit tough to answer on. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, okay, so Judy's saying the beach chair is calling, but that's not, doesn't involve any thinking. Yeah. So if it's, the, what, then, which is getting at exactly what I'm trying to pull out here in, in my awkward way. Um, if it's just our feelings, if this is just going to, this choice is just going to be based simply on personal feelings about something, then we don't, we wouldn't say that's being, you were doing critical thinking. But if, for instance, like Carol's saying here, we have some criteria and maybe we have a family group and we have to kind of find something that's suitable for, for everybody or we've, we really have to be careful about safety or we're bringing in some different criteria, then a choice like this could be um, involving critical thinking. I see a couple of people still writing, so I'll just wait. How are the, you know? Mm hmm Yeah, Jeff, I think you've, you've captured what we, I was trying to get at here. That there, you could have the same um, basic activity, but whether you do it in a critically thoughtful way or not, uh, is, is just depends. Do you have criteria and are you, are you thinking through them to make your choice? Okay, so yes, if we were, if we were bringing in things like safe and enjoyable, then we would be thinking critically. Okay, let's move along here. Um, this is just another way of phrasing it as saying critical thinking is criterial thinking. So the big ideas here tonight, first of all, that we just talked about critical thinking requires explicit criteria for judgment. Um, and then the two next ideas are very key to the whole TC squared approach. First of all, by teaching students to use criteria for judgment, we help them with their thinking, and this is not just valuable in school, but it's valuable in life, and especially in the complicated, complex, connected world where we're moving into and, and the change that's happening in this 21st century. Um, the other aspect of this, though, is that when we do ask students to make decisions and we engage them in, in um, thinking critically about the curriculum, because we're always embedding this in the curriculum, um, they become more deeply engaged and with that engagement comes deeper learning. So there really um, are two payoffs to, to using critical thinking in the classroom. One is helping students learn to think and become better thinkers, as we were just saying, and the other is that this thinking helps them to learn. So this, this little phrase slogan here, learn to think and think to learn, is really what uh, um, TC Squared is all about. Now, this framework will be very familiar to some of you, um, some not so much, but, and we definitely do not have time tonight to go into, um, go into things in any kind of detail, but I do want, I'm just trying to find my little, 
pointer thing, but I'm not having much luck. Okay, well, I'll, oh, there it is. So framing critical challenges is, what, is a really big part of this approach, as, as some of you know. Um, and nurturing thoughtful communities is also important. But underlying those is the importance of teaching students tools. Because we can pose wonderful questions, um, but if we don't support students with the intellectual tools they need, we'll get a handful of kids with their hands waving and a lot of kids who will not be able to respond to those questions. So um, what we're going to look at tonight is this whole idea of teaching the tools and a little bit about assessing the thinking. Now, the tool that we're particularly looking at, of course, is the criteria for judgment tool. Um, background knowledge is always important. Uh, we talk about students coming with some background, but also using the, the, the challenges that we pose to drive the desire to and the motivation to gain more background knowledge. Um, we talk about critical thinking vocabulary as being the um, concepts and so on that students need to, that are, are the, required by good critical thinkers. Thinking strategies are often graphic organizers or other ways of, of accessing um, and organizing your thinking. And habits of mind, of course, are, are what they sound like. They are um, things like being open-minded, being curious, and so on that help learning. Now, I just think the, easy, the best way to show this is with an example. So here we've got um, some pictures related to travel in the Arctic. And typically, what we might do is get students to write up a piece or make a poster or something about how do people travel in the Arctic, um, maybe comparing in the old days to now and so on. With the critical thinking approach, we frame a critical challenge which requires students to make a decision. And this is, a, this is an example from a book, um, a publication uh, about the Inuit. Uh, and a TC squared publication. And I am very fond of this challenge because it's one of the very first ones I used as a teacher when I was getting into TC squared approach. So, so what type of is more effective, dog team or snowmobile? So that's the question. Okay, so we're asking students to make a decision. And then we have to also think, well, what tools are they going to need? to be able to make that decision and to tackle that challenge successfully. So coming back to what we were just talking about with the framework, we've got these tools um, that students need. Now because we're um, focusing on the criteria tonight, I'm just going to fill in <laughs> the other ones for you so we, and just talk about them very briefly. Uh, we, students will need to know about the Arctic environment. Um, they'll need to learn, probably, about dog teams and snowmobiles. In the, um, in the publication that this challenge came from, there was a, a fact sheet about dog teams and a fact sheet about snowmobiles. Um, when we get to the critical thinking vocabulary, one of the things that students need to be able to understand is how do we talk about advantages and disadvantages. Uh, a thinking strategy for doing that is using a data chart, using a chart that has a list of uh, possibility, possible criteria down one side and then advantages and disadvantages across the top. Um, and, and probably open-mindedness is a good habit of mind here because um, some kids will say dog team right away because they love dogs or snowmobile because they think that sounds exciting. But what we're asking them to do is hold that judgment and, and actually consider um, the criteria. So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is think about some criteria for judgment that students might use to decide between a dog team or a snowmobile. Or actually, and um, what would be some valid criteria um, that, that we might use to make this decision? 
So let's use the whiteboard again if possible. And if you if you can't get that working, um, let's use the the chat box. Any questions though? Is this clear? What uh, kind of similar to the idea of what we were doing with the the travel, but now we're looking at something that's actually in the curriculum. Now, if anybody would like rather just talk to this, please go ahead. Um, just click on your mic and, and chime in. I would love to hear other voices. <laughs> Lisa, I'm thinking about your uh, grade 11 biology, your senior biology, and wondering how much of the uh, uh, biology curriculum might connect with environmental impacts and whether you might take a challenge like this and, and compare it for, from a different perspective, you know, uh, you know, demand on the environment one way or the other and actually do some comparisons with the, uh, the, uh, the biological side of things. Absolutely. Uh, that's uh, something extremely important that we would ask the students. Um, also, how durable your choice is. You know, is it long-term uh, availability? Is it a good long-term decision? I think we would have to think about how the climate is changing as well, because that might change the distance and how you are able to travel. Um, yeah, I think the uh, environment and climate to me is very, very important. Okay, well it looks to me like we're getting some key ideas down here about um, about fuel and, and um, just sort of general upkeep um, and then other ideas about uh, distance to travel and, and speed of delivery that to me tie in with sort of the what is the actual context that that's going to be or what's the actual purpose of, of the um, of the um, mode of travel cost again can be very important um, environmental impact as we've just uh, heard Louise and, and Lisa discussing um, so we're getting some really key ideas here. Now typically, of course, we, we would, um, if we were doing this with students, we would be pulling things together. It's a little awkward to do it on the, on the whiteboard here. It works well on an interactive whiteboard or even on you know, pieces of paper that you're sorting, uh, cards that you're going to sort and so on. But um, Mainly what, what we want to do is usually narrow it down to, to a handful of key factors or criteria. So we've got lots of good ones there. Now, here are some that I think are pretty much overlapping with what, what we've, you've just been saying. And these, I want to just like focus on those for a minute. Those are the criteria for judgment. They're just criteria students would use to decide whether they thought a dog team or a snowmobile would be the most effective mode of transportation. Now I'm going to make things a little harder. I'm going to add in another column here. Now these are not, don't try to read across from one point to another. These are two separate lists. Um, how would you def maybe um, define the difference between column A, the criteria for judgment that is in line with what we were thinking about, and the kinds of things that are in column B. So I'm going to give you a few moments to think about this because this is, this is a really crucial thing to get our heads around.
and maybe just write in the chat box or grab the microphone when you have a an idea. And please take a risk and just throw something out. Do not feel like uh, that we have to be, um, you know, can only say something if we're sure it's right. Lisa, go ahead if you'd like to speak. Uh, yeah, I think the ones on the right look more like uh, what I've used uh, in the past. And uh, I think you address mostly content and format of what I would like them to say versus uh, okay. what sound in A is more open. You know, it's more of a, an open, wide uh, question. Okay. Okay, so things on the right sound more familiar to things you've used in the past. Is that is that's that right. right? Yeah, I think they. Okay. They really and what would have been your what would have been your purpose when you used those kind of criteria in the past? I think more driven by evaluation, because those are things okay. that are uh, clearly they belong to more clear categories and they're more directly linked to what your evaluation grid would look like. Okay, okay. And I see that Judy's saying um, that B is more like assessment. And that that's and, and then I think all your observations on this are, are you know insightful. Um, the clear distinction that I'd like us to make tonight is that criteria for judgment are the things that students are going to be using, the factors they're going to be considering when they make these decisions that the critical challenge asks them to make. The criteria on, on the right hand side and here under the B um, are the criteria for assessment. So they're focused on the thinking, but they're related to assessing and um, you know making our, our assessment of students' learning, of their achievement. So depending on if it's, if it's an ongoing assessment for learning, it might be right in the middle of the process, might be assessment as learning uh, or summative at the end and more tending to evaluation. Um, and I think the criteria on the on the left, like Carol, you were saying, you know, for whom people, we could we could work more on those. We could define them more clearly. Uh, I don't think the clarity is, is is not the distinction I was <laughs> trying to get at here anyway. What I really wanted you to recognize is that when we talk about criteria for judgment in the TC squared context, we aren't referring to the typical criteria for assessment that we would usually be familiar with. So, um, so this is a distinction. Now I'm going to give you one more column. Oh, there's the slide with those things. On. Now, here's the next column is some other things, and I'm wondering how you would categorize those. Okay, so we've got um, Jeff saying that it's it's required formatting doesn't affect the judgment specific expectations. Carol saying expectations, Judy. Yeah, I think you've really captured this one. These are the things, and uh, I think the word was was implied there. The idea of requirements. Yeah, they are quick. <laughs> They're very quick. Um, I think that this often, I know for myself as a, when I was a classroom teacher and I know for teachers I've, I've been working with, this is a big aha when they start to see the difference between the, the criteria for judgment, the criteria for assessment, and then especially if they're, if they're giving out a, a major assignment or a project, the actual requirements. And 
that we don't really want to mix the requirements in with our criteria because criteria are really related to quality and requirements are more descriptive. Um, one thing that I found worked very well is to have students check off the requirements on a list before they were handing something in. Like these are the things that must be there. Um, these ones all seem to relate to the format, but you could have, I mean, you can have other kinds of requirements that are, you know, must refer to um, a certain number of uh, sources, or, for instance. But then you, you can be a little bit trapped by requirements when students say, well, I did all these things. I put in five illustrations. Well, they might have been totally irrelevant real illustrations or they might have been very poorly done or whatever, but if, if it's a requirement, um, it's just either it's there or it's not. And it's not really related to the quality. So I think it's really important to, to see this distinction, especially when we're um, trying to be very clear with, with assignments that we're giving to students or challenges that we're giving them. Now, um, in the case that we just looked at, so we're going to make this even a little bit more complicated. In the case we just looked at with the, um, <clears throat> with the um, uh, Arctic travel, these two or three things were very separate. Lisa, do you want to comment? Question? Uh, yes. I, I'm struggling a little bit with um, the requirements. In science, when uh, a kid tells me that, um, for example, an organism or, or um, an operation is effective. Um, wh what I would like is for them to back it up with statistics to make sure that it's not an opinion. Now, statistics, I think if I look at your three columns, would be more in the requirements. However, to me, it, it, um, it makes the work uh, I'm, I'm looking for the English word here, reliable. So how would I marry the two? Well, you know what, I, I'm thinking, and I could be wrong, but it seems to me that, that what you're referring to is really this idea of um, providing relevant, em relevant evidence. Is that fair to say? Because it's not just any statistics that you want them to show. I think it's, it's those relevant ones. Is that? Is that right, Lisa? Um, uh, yes, I agree. I and think you say relevant, what? Relevant proof or? Well, it depends, you know, the, it, it all depends so much on the content and the con context that we're talking about. But generally speaking, one of the one of the big ideas with critical thinking is that we provide evidence for our conclusions that we provide, right? So I think when you're talking about statistics, um, it seems to me that you're talking about having students provide relevant evidence or, rel you know, um, backup for, um, for their um, whatever it is. They're, now are they, they're making a decision? They're, they're yes, they are. describing something. They're making a yeah. decision yeah. in order to decide which um, organisme de bienfaisant or, for example, Orbis or Smile Train. These are organisms that help in developing countries to improve the lives of, of either people with uh, retinoblastoma, which is like a, an eye cancer, or with mm -hmm. um, uh, the hair lip, I can't remember what mm -hmm. it's called in English, but um, so for them to prove to me that they've made a judgment, uh, I don't want it based on anything airy-fairy, I need relevant evidence. So I'm not sure how to express that uh, other than, you know, if I ask them to judge which organism is the, uh, organism is the most effective in improving life in developing countries, um, I'm thinking they will come up with criteria, but how can I ask them to, would this be a requirement that they have relevant evidence or does that have to be one of the criteria? 
Well, it seems to me it's, it's more than a, a requirement. Like criteria refer to quality. And I mean, you might be saying, I require that you uh, pay attention to these criteria. But, but the criteria refer to quality. So if there's a range of ways that this could be provided, like if some students could provide just a little bit of evidence and, and, and some students could put in some statistics, but they weren't really appropriate or re you know, valid or solid um, statistics, then I think, I think we're talking about a criterion here, but maybe um, in this case, you would develop it more with your students to be, um, you know, relevant statistical evidence or relevant, um, you know, scientific evidence. Something that would be um, uh, really, really appropriate for the content. Um, I think, you know, this isn't a, <laughs> this isn't a, a big, solid line between these two things, that the criteria for assessment and the requirements. But it is a key point that sometimes those requirements, somebody could meet all those requirements and still not do a high quality, critically thoughtful job of the task. So it's just something mm -hmm. to keep in mind. I don't, you know, I don't think it's something we have to, you know, lie awake at night over, but, and I don't think there's a black wall between them there. But I do think what you're talking about sounds to me like criteria for for creating a solid uh, defense of whatever it is they've chosen. So okay, thank does you. Does that fit at all, Lisa? I don't know. Yes, that that uh, that gives me a good uh, a good link to where I want to go. Thank you. Okay, good. Some of these things, I think we just we have to keep revisiting them in different contexts, and and uh, it's you know it's never going to be black and white, but it is, um, it is developing and it is worth thinking about for sure. So back to here where we had these things being very separate um, and the requirements, I'm going to leave them as a little separate box. But So this is our back to our Arctic travel. We've got the criteria for judgment that students are going to use. We've got the criteria for assessment that the teacher is going to use in assessing the student work. Now. Sometimes, and this is maybe kind of what we were getting at there, sometimes these things are going to overlap and it really depends on the type of task that you're giving students to do. So um, what we're going to do now is think about a task where though there might be that overlap and uh, I don't know how, <laughs> how relevant this example is to the, the grade levels people have here, but I do think this is a really um, fun book. This author, John Klassen, is a Canadian. He won the uh, Caldecott Award in the States last year for this, for this book. And I think because it doesn't, um, it doesn't lay out exactly what happens towards the end of the book, it's a really good one, even with older kids, to get them thinking about um, how do we explain something that we don't, we don't know for sure, but we're going to provide evidence from the story from the, or from the historical situation, whatever it is, we're going to provide evidence for our explanation. So the, the challenge here would be to create a plausible explanation and um, we would talk about the criteria for what makes a plausible explanation. But before we do that, I want you to have a little glimpse of this book. So. Um, we are going to do a quick little jaunt over to YouTube where you get a very concise trailer for the book. But it does show you that the book does not spell things out anymore uh, or doesn't really define things a lot more than this little trailer does. So now, Louise, let's see if I can manage this. We're going to go on a web tour. Um, you will see the video and then we will automatically be back here. Is that correct, Louise? We will pull them back here, but uh, the video will okay. automatically start. Okay, now. Um, just get this set up. Are you good? I think I'm good. I'm not fast, but I think I'm okay. <laughs> All right, here okay. we go. Oh, it might be loud, so be prepared to turn down your volume if it is. <laughs> mm -hmm.
Okay. Okay. So what happened? Um, there are a few more clues in the book itself, I should say. There's a big fish and there's a lobster who, did, who gives away a few things. <laughs> What's the plan? Okay. So, um, so what I'd like to ask you to do is think about in a case like this where we're asking for uh, a plausible explanation and that's a type of critical challenge we call usually a design to specification. So it's not, <laughs> um, you just have to think. Um, so we want a plausible explanation. Now the, the book does not say anything except we see the big fish swimming away with his little hat back on his head and we see the lobster who pointed the big fish in that direction looking kind of guilty. Um, so we don't know for sure, although I think most of us will assume that the little fish did get eaten. But if we want to ask for a plausible explanation, we're going to have some criteria for what makes a plausible explanation. And at the same time, when we have the students doing this work, creating these explanations, we might be assessing their thinking. So I just want you to think for a moment and um, think about the overlap here between these two things. And we'll leave the requirements out for the time being. But just thinking about what might be the same and what might be different. And I'm going to show you in a sec um, an example and see, we'll use it as what we call a critique of the piece. You can tell me if it makes sense to you or not. So here, here, are, some, here are some ideas. So for the plausible explanation, we want something based on evidence from the story and reasonable in the context of the story. And we might add something about being realistic in the real world, you know, fitting with what we know about the world or something like that as well. Um, when we're, uh, so those, those two criteria I've got there are, where's my little thing? So they're in the circle of plausible explanation for students to use as they create their explanations. They're going to be thinking, is my explanation based on evidence from the story? Um, and there are little clues in the illustrations and so on that they could use. Um, is my explanation reasonable? Does it make sense? Is it logical in this context? Now, as we assess their thinking, we might also be assessing the product. So we might also be looking at did they provide evidence from the story? Did they make a logical um, inference and, and logical reasoning that they based it on? But as, as the teachers, we might be going further and actually looking at, a, at their thinking more broadly and were they able to choose accurate and appropriate evidence? Were they able to clearly explain their reasoning? So this, this, is a, this is another place where we, it's good to be clear about these distinctions but also to recognize that there is some overlap. So I'm going to stop here for a minute and just, just hear what you think. Does this, is this making sense or is this just, <laughs> is this just getting confusing? Um, maybe write in the chat box or grab the microphone. Or maybe I've lost everybody. <laughs> Louise, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm still. Or maybe everybody's just thinking. I should say thinking, right? Because this does take quite a bit of thinking to get our heads around this. Now, I have okay. a question, <laughs> Cynthia, while other people are thinking and getting their yeah, thoughts yeah. sorted out. Would it often be found that uh, that a that a teacher might be developing their criteria for assessment prior to developing the, the, the criteria that they would like the students to be using? And if so, 
is there often a corresponding one that's just at a, a different level or coming from a different perspective for the students and that, uh, uh, that there's what the student is expected to use and then the teachers got their own criteria that's evaluating how the student used that particular one? Does it often line up like that? I'm not sure that I'm quite getting what you say. I, what I'm thinking is that, yes, a student is often, the, 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 teacher, the, the teacher's assessment is, is, should be based on learning outcomes, you know, and, and we are very much encouraging the assess, focusing on the, the process kind of outcomes, the thinking kind of, right? So well, I'm thinking that, for instance, the criteria for assessments in the top right there chooses accurate and appropriate evidence. It kind of lines up with the shared criteria that's based on evidence. So they both relate to evidence, and the next mm -hmm, one below mm -hmm. shows some, you know, reasonable as well as reasoning. Right, so it's right. like, you know, the, the student has to decide is this reasonable, and the teacher decides if, if how they came about it use the reasoning that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, and I think that is that is sort of typical. The, the product itself, that one particular um, plausible explanation is, is kind of an example of these bigger learning outcomes. So yes, they are often very connected. Um, and so does that Yes, I think yes, and I think it in ties into to what you're saying, Louise. Yeah, yeah. I think it yeah. ties into Jeff's comment there as well about uh, what would be by itself than just the, the mm -hmm. student criteria. Yeah, and that's a good question, Jeff, because I I'm not sure that there would be in this kind of a case where I'm not sure that there would be something that would be only in the left hand bubble. Um, can anybody else think of something that would be? I mean, when we ask students to, to make a plausible explanation and we, when we uh, work together to figure out what are the criteria for a plausible explanation, we want them to use those criteria um, when they're responding to that challenge. So, because not all critical challenges are, you know, is this better than this or could we call that judge better or best. Um, I'm just, yeah, any criteria would be part of the assessment. Yes, yes. And Lisa, reproducible in other contexts, are you referring to the, the, um, the broader criteria for assessment? Yeah, yeah. Now, this really depends on the type of, we have basically in TC squared outlines, uh, six types of critical challenges, and the ones where we're critiquing or we're judging better or best, those are like the snowmobile and dog team. The criteria for assessment, you know, cost, fuel, efficiency, so on, are very different than the criteria for assessment. But when you have something like design to specifications, which this plausible explanation would be, um, there's a much bigger overlap because the students, and basically what it comes down to and, and where it really overlaps is when we bring in a lot of student self-assessment, which of course is what, you know, is what we're hearing from the research that this is the most important um, for student learning is to involve students in the assessment. So, um, I'm just, uh, yeah. Yeah, the fluidity, it, it's, it's, it's not so much fluidity as it is diversity, depending on the context and the type of challenge you're giving. Um, no criteria, only for assessment. Well, I think for sure, Jeff, and I, 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 I think when, you, when we talk about student self-assessment, the two circles, in my mind, would probably overlap. Lisa, go ahead. Um, I really enjoy what's in the middle of that bubble based on evidence from story and reasonable in story context. Uh, even my grade 11 students, uh, when I ask them uh, to adapt what we've learned in class to a specific subject that they've chosen for uh, a project, I find my weaker students have that difficulty 
indeed. Now, for, for them to do those two things, um, I do think that to choose accurate and appropriate evidence is a step in the right direction, um, but they need to be able to, like I find that the two top ones are so closely related that I find it's difficult to think that one can happen without the other. I was wondering what you were thinking about that. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I can see the, the very close connection here and I think um, you know, it, it really depends. Like in the day-to-day -day giving feedback, you're going to be focused on the one that's in the overlap. I'm trying to think as you go farther out and you're using different pieces of evidence for your students and you're trying to sort of sum up some of their competencies or their abilities that you want to be looking more at their you know, so overall ability to choose accurate and appropriate evidence. So it, I know in this in this context, the way we're talking about is very very similar. But I think it's yeah, something. You know, I I think it's something to keep in mind of, of sort of as an overall assessment. What are those things you're really looking for, as opposed to just assessing a partic one particular product. Because that. this does um, relate to what I asked you before about mm -hmm. uh, the right research. So I was in the right of the bubble, chooses accurate and appropriate evidence. Now accurate and appropriate can be defined with criteria, but mm -hmm. if I move to the left, based on evidence from the story, uh, I think they have to use that in order to choose what's appropriate and accurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they don't always mm -hmm. connect the two, surprisingly enough. <laughs> no, and this is, <laughs> this is where our work is cut out for us. But I think that the exciting thing is that, you know, that we're really working towards now getting students engaged in this thinking, um, mm -hmm. which is so much more valuable than, than the, you know, transmissive uh, teaching and then expecting to hear, hear back exactly what we, what we told them. Um, I'm going to I'm going to move on here because there's some other things that I think are really important. But um, hopefully we'll you know we'll, we'll have time to pause and uh, and go in. This is excellent discussion we're having here, and I, and I think it's really really valuable. Um, Jeff, I'm just going to quickly say um, it, it, more criteria for assessment if you're looking at your whole big list of things, but not necessarily. It really just Again, it depends on the actual um, situation, and maybe as we look at some some examples, these things will become a little clearer as well. Um, one thing I was going to have us talk about, but I think maybe we will. Um, well, let's talk about this <laughs> fairly quickly. Sometimes we want to take time to um, set criteria or, or, or to co-construct criteria with students. I should say that's. What on the right here, and sometimes we want to set the criteria ourselves and just basically give the criteria to the students. Um, any thoughts on what would, what, when it would be better to just set the criteria yourself? I think I'm going to assume that a lot of people are thinking, and maybe it will take us too long to work through it, but uh, Judy, I see your writing. Louise's writing. Okay. Sadly, when there was a little time, and I think that's probably the biggest thing for all of us because there's never enough time. So, so setting the criteria, sometimes we just need to do it because the, the, the time is is short in the classroom and we don't always have time to go into co-constructing criteria. I think what we need to keep in mind also is sometimes um, we're going to use criteria over and over again so it would be worth co-constructing those criteria because we want students to really grasp them. I'm thinking in math for instance if we have some criteria for effective problem solving strategies we're going to use those again and again, so it would be worthwhile to put the time in to um, to co-construct them. 
Jeff, you're you're talking about some of these same ideas. I think new territory, new once if they're familiar, um, you know, it, they won't take as long to co-construct them. But on the uh, on the flip side of that as well, if they're going to be used again and again, it's worth putting the time in to do it. Um, Lisa, I can see your writing here. Okay, you agree. Well, let's let's move along. I think we're <laughs> so basically. I want to share with you three three ideas, and this is certainly not exhaustive, but three ways to help with co-constructing criteria for judgment. Um, so remembering that these are the criteria students are going to use when they make their decisions. So one way is to critique an example. Now, with um, with young students, you might be talking about something like. You know, let's choose a classroom pet. Well, what are criteria for a classroom pet? And the younger the students are, or maybe even with older students, you sometimes want to pick a very obviously unsuitable example to start to say, well, what would be suitable? For instance, you might say, would an elephant be suitable? And of course, some kids would say yes, just to be silly, but but if you've got the discussion going, well, why wouldn't an elephant be suitable? And uh, so, for instance, from from that example or non-example, you would be able to to figure out well, the suitable pet has to be um, a size that is manageable in the classroom. You talk about food. What does you know? How could you manage to feed it? What what does it eat? It has to be, um, you know, we have to be able to clean up after it. Those kind of things would all be come out of a discussion about an example. Now, another way to to co-construct criteria for judgment is to pair to compare a couple of examples and. Um, this, this, in this case, um, you might be looking for what are the criteria for a, a quotable quote. And if we put a couple of examples here and say, well, which of these seems more quotable, um, then we can look at, well, why did we pick that one? What made it more quotable than the other, the other one? Now, if you were um, Focusing on understanding by design, as it is in this, this might be a perfectly wonderful quote. It was something I just pulled out as an, to have a contrast here. But uh, typically, when we talk about quotable quotes, we come up with things like we want it to be meaningful, of course, we want it to be succinct, and possibly also to have an element of surprise to it. Now, these criteria that I've um, Included here, um, when we send out a e-digest um, e every month, and we always put in a quote of the month and, and have a lesson connected to it. And these are the criteria that we use in that lesson um, for uh, for students to use as they're just you know they need to decide is this a quotable quote or not, or how quotable is it. Um, Another example of comparing two two things would be, um, if, you know, pennies. You can't use them anymore, but we can collect them. And I, as far as I know, we can still cash them in at the banks. People are collecting pennies. So if you were going to compare counting strategies, should we just count them all by ones? Should we make piles of ten? Um, you might look for some possible criteria for students to use when they were making this decision. Um, for instance, we could talk about the accounting strategy needs to be accurate. Um, it needs to be fairly efficient. Uh, it could be something that we can check once we're done. And we need to understand what we're doing. So these, you know, I'm thinking young students here. Uh, but these, um, these criteria might be tricky the way they're worded. Um, does anybody want to suggest another way you might say um, accurate? Because some, and then the point that I want to bring out here is that as adults, we often want to give a one-word um, criterion. For instance, efficient, or we want to say cost is a factor to consider. Sometimes it, it's much better with students if we actually uh, create a phrase or even a sentence to describe the criterion.
I'm going to give you some suggestions here and see. I can see Louise's writing, but um, I'm going to move on here. So just some suggestions. And I don't think this is just with really young children. I think with older students as well. It's sometimes, yeah, seems like it could really happen if it's reasonable. Gives the right answer in the math context. Efficient, we might say it doesn't take too long. Um, because we don't want, and just a little bit of a side track, we don't want students to be thinking it has to be super, super fast. That's not what we mean by efficient. We mean it doesn't waste time. It doesn't waste effort. Um, checkable can be easily checked when you're done. Um, well understood, we might say something like, I know what I'm doing. So those are some other criteria for judgment uh, examples. Now, when we have a critical challenge and we're trying to think about how to make, how to, what kind of criteria might be important for it, it's often helpful if we make sure that we've got some sort of qualifying word or phrase in there. And Louise, I see your question about building the vocabulary. Yes, yes. Um, and, and explicitly discussing it with students is really important. Now, here's some sample tasks um, that we could use to build critical challenges. But the way they are right now, it's a little vague, maybe. A little hard to see what the criteria might might be. So I'm going to give you another version here. And, and I'm going to ask you, what, what's the difference between these? And, and, and is it a helpful difference? And I'm going to ask people to write in the chat box or grab the microphone when they have a comment to make on this one. Okay, so we've got some people still writing. Just wait a minute, but look at what other people are putting in the chat box. Okay, so yeah, yeah, it's it's those words that just make it clear that we're expecting a certain quality, a certain aspect to these. Uh, to um, products or these tasks that that um, that really give us an opportunity then to open up the, what the criteria for judgment are. Now, um, Jeff, you bring up a really good point here that uh, that you know it seems they seem to make an impact. You think they wouldn't create uninformative posters, but I think for some of our kids, they really need to have this made explicit. You know, you you sort of assume they're going to be able to, they're all going to understand what you're expecting from a poster. But I've taught a long time and I know that there's some kids who just are not on the same wavelength as we are. And I think the beauty of this approach with TC Squared is that we do make these things more explicit. Um, I'm just going to see, I see some people writing. So yeah. Judy, exact, that's exactly been my experience. And I've had, I remember one father coming in and really giving me a hard time because he thought his daughter had, had should have gotten an A on her poster because she spent so many hours coloring it so nicely. And so this is where we're really trying to be clear um, about, about this. So. But we're not going to leave it just at these qualifiers. <laughs> <But, laughs> you are so, that's really right, Judy. When you sent home these projects, you never know who did them. Whose work are you marking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I just want to carry this a little bit further there. So there's those qualifiers, of course. And uh, yeah, yeah. And especially and with the internet stuff that we're doing right that's happening now, um, 
you know, it's so tempting for kids to cut and paste and so on. Anyway, let's uh, let's keep going here. So these words are not the final criteria. They're just the way that they're a good springboard, though, that help us then say, okay, so what is a significant event? And um, I'm looking at our time here. I think we could we could spend a, you know just have a few ideas about it. Um, what would make a if we're asking students to think of a significant event in his in historical event? Um, what might be some of the ideas that they would or the criteria for judgment that they would need to use to decide what were the most what, what were the most significant events? Okay, a game changer, Carol says. So, so something that really has an impact. Um, ah, so so uh, and Judy's uh, people outside Canada would know. So something that had um, a broad impact, maybe, or or be, not just a local impact, but a broad impact. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and that really made a, a difference to the way the country developed. Wow, you guys have some great ideas. Okay, I think I don't see anybody else writing, but all oh, excellent ideas. So here, this I'm just showing you that we, we always are trying to embed these challenges in the curriculum. So here's that critical challenge. Identify the five most significant events in Canada during the first half of the 20th century. And um, <laughs> we, <laughs> you're distracting me here with your <laughs> hashtag. Um, so, so when we ha have a challenge like this, of course, then we are developing the criteria. And you came up with some excellent criteria for, for a judgment on that. By the way, these um, illustrations here are from the source docs uh, collections on the TC Squared website. Um, some of you have access to these through your school or your school district. I'm not sure if everybody does. But um, it's these primary documents that I find really fascinating. This is a photograph of outside the Toronto Star office on the night that the First World War was declared. Um, this one is a picture of the Halifax explosion, or after the Halifax explosion. Um, this is a young boy who was um, taken and put into residential school, I think just before the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge. Now, one thing that um, that's important to, to know is that there are resources for helping teachers have some idea of what the criteria for judgment might be. Because when you go into co-construct with students, I think one of the the really key things is to have at least some criteria in your mind already that you know are going to be important. Um, you're going to be listening to the students and, and brainstorming and so on, but you want to be able to, to move that discussion in, in uh, productive ways. So it's important to have some ideas. And one of the, one of the resources that we have that's very helpful, I think, is, is the Tools for Thought uh, resource. And I just wanted to show you an example connected with this idea of significance. So this is a tool for thought about considering significance. Um, these are lesson plans that these newer ones, the basic tools, are about four pages long. Um, and I want to get to, I know you, I'm not giving you enough time to really look at this closely. But um, I want to show you what the tool, this tool for thought includes as criteria. So if we look down here, and these, I think, overlap with what you were saying, prominence at the time, lasting nature of impact. Um, now the, net, the bottom of that page says magnitude of impact. So these are directly related to the things that, uh, that you people came up with. The scope of the impact, how widespread was it, and how does revealing of the times, does it help our understanding of that period? So um, I think you can see there that, that it's good to, I mean, for myself anyway, it's good to have a, 
a backup to help me figure out what the criteria for judgment are sometimes. Now down at the bottom here, um, in these tools for, uh, tools for thought, there are also criteria for assessment. So you can have a look here and see, again, we're kind of getting a bit of an overlap, but also looking um, at the bigger ideas, the bigger learning outcomes that we're aiming for when we, when we look at the criteria for assessment. So does anybody have any comments or questions about that? Because I think uh, that kind of illustrates some of the things we've talked about. Lisa? Yeah, would you mind backing up one slide? I find this one very, very useful. Uh, thank you. Prominence at the time and lasting nature of impact. If you don't mind holding it just a second. Thank you. Now, I, I noticed that Louise has put the links in um, to, so how you can reach these. You can become an individual. I'm not. I'm not trying to sell this. I think people, uh, a lot of you already have access to these, depending on your school board and so on. But uh, you can um, you can see samples. And there's quite a, a lot you can see without being logging in. But if you do have, if your board is a partner or your school's partner, and you haven't already um, logged in and signed up for your member, your um, password, uh, definitely do so. There's just a huge, rich treasure of things there for available. So where would this be, they Cynthia, in, in the whole internet site that I do go there? Um, mm -hmm. Where would I find this? Well, it's under Teaching Resources. OK. And it's Tools for Thought. Thank you. And it's particularly designed for grades five and up. So for your level, Lisa, be, you know, you'd find lots that would be very appropriate for your, your what you're teaching. Um, and there are some, there are some, um, in another part under professional resources, there's some tips for teachers about ways to use this. But they, I, actually, if you go for the, to the Tools for Thought page, um, under teaching resources, you'll see some support documents as well as the tools themselves. So Thank you very much. Okay. Now, now oh, we're, how's our how's our time here? Oh, we're we're, we're moving along. I just um, I did want you to look at one thing. I think we'll do this because it is a good example. Just trying to think how much time we have here. Um, you know what? I think we've done a lot. I'm going to, I'm just going to uh, just tell you about this very quickly because it would take uh, some time for you to read it through. It's a blog post um, and, and we can share it with you. It's, it's Parkland School District in Alberta, just uh, north of, northwest of Edmonton, has done a lot of work with critical thinking. And they also have a blog that uh, teachers, students, bus drivers, administrators, everybody contributes. They have a lot, uh, every day there's a guest blogger, except on, not on weekends. And um, the one yesterday I was excited about because it's a teacher talking about cri setting criteria for judgment with her students. Actually, you know what, Louise? How are people feeling? Can, we, can, we, can you give me a green check mark if you've got enough energy to look at a two-paragraph blog post? Okay, Judy does. Okay, okay. I think it's worthwhile because it kind of yeah. Thanks, Louise. So this is this is the blog post, and we need to scroll down. I I guess yeah. We can just scroll down here. So if you want to just have a quick look at this and just think about her method of, of or their method, it's grade one teachers. Um, I'll be quiet and let you look at it.
And when you've done, maybe um, just uh, give a, t a check mark or write something in the chat box to show us that you're back and um, you've had a chance to look at it. Okay. Yeah, and the Wordle, I, I think some of you are already familiar with that, but that's what they used here. <laughs> that's right. And I think this is a nice example that gives you, it, it reinforces this idea of what we're talking about when we talk about um, criteria for judgment. So there, it wasn't the criteria for um, judging the student's work, it was a criteria for them to, to think about who a, who a hero is, what, a hero, what the characteristics of a hero are. Now there was one thing in there I, I would just say, if, um, I want you to notice that the teacher said um, something about, I thought I had it written down here, oh she said in the final part of our, our challenge each class narrowed down their traits to identify four key criteria that are essential for heroes to have. So it wasn't just making the word wordle, it was also discussing their traits. Yes, Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, my son had Lisa, did yeah, you my son had something on a hero as well and he was in grade eight and the teacher didn't do that. And while everybody's looking mm -hmm. up Gandhi and and whoever Here's my son at Chapters looking for a book on Al Capone, so I was really <laughs> upset. Um, but you know what, once we had a long discussion, his criteria was a factor of influence. And that's all, the only one he looked at. So mm. I let him, you know, he went ahead and did the assignment, but as it went through, we had discussions on ethical ways of doing things and so on. It turned out to be a fantastic experience because I was able to guide him and have amazing discussions with him. But um, I must tell you, it was a, a process <laughs> that started out pretty badly. I think we all learn from it. And uh, if ever I have an assignment like that, I think I would start with the criteria. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great, that's a wonderful example, and it's kind of like the elephant is it a suitable classroom pet, but but a perfect example um, of what we're talking about here, that how important it is to bring out these things explicitly. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Lisa. Now, um, if we have any other questions or thoughts, uh, we can stay on for a while. I think we've covered a lot of. Uh, very deep and thought-provoking things here, so I, 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 I know that some of them you will need to digest more after we've talked about them, but hopefully as you're doing your teaching and planning, um, these ideas will come back to you and then help, help make it clear what, what we're talking about when we talk about getting kids to do critical thinking and use criteria for judgment. So thanks everybody for your participation. Um, it's been, I've really enjoyed working with you tonight. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I just want to draw everyone's attention to the, uh, the link to the center of the screen, which you actually can click on, and that is our feedback link for tonight's session. And uh, the lower link is uh, the one that takes you back to our calendar of uh, upcoming sessions. Um, and we do have uh, have some more. We've got one tomorrow night on uh, on uh, livening up literacy, fun and engaging tools. And next week we've got uh, global dignity, which is a Canada-wide initiative, as well as uh, Cynthia. You are back with us again next week on uh, fostering critical thinking in mathematics. Is that correct? A smiley face. Uh, yes, yeah, <laughs> that is correct. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be ready. <laughs> no, no pressure. No, no, no pressure. No, no. I think we, we've actually done one before uh, last year. Mm -hmm. We did uh, one on, on that. So. Yeah. Elementary, I might add. Yes, that's correct. Elementary mathematics. And then sandwiched in between there on Wednesday, we've got uh, a session on BYOD and sharing ideas in your classroom. If you're a BYOD uh, proponent and working with that with your students. Um, Syria, are you uh, are you there? You want to jump in? I am. Thank you, Louise, and thank you so much, Cynthia, for sharing 
um, many tools and ideas, um, criteria for judgment um, to engage students in critical thinking. Um, I think this is so important in the classroom uh, at all grades and levels. Um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for giving of your time tonight and participating and sharing your ideas. Um, it's always great to, to see people's comments in the chat box and, uh, and, to, and to hear your voices. Um, as Louise mentioned, uh, please take a few minutes to uh, fill in the feedback. Um, your feedback is really important to us. And we're in the process right now of planning uh, the winter spring program. So um, we'd love to hear your ideas of um, uh, other workshops that you'd like to see. And, uh, and do put them in uh, the feedback survey, because we certainly go through them and use your ideas uh, for the planning. Uh, share the link to OTF Connects with your colleagues and encourage them to participate. Uh, Louise mentioned um, the variety of workshops that we've got over the next week. And after that, we'll have a, a, a bit of a break um, uh, till after, after the Christmas holidays. Now, uh, one more thing I'd like to mention before I let you go tonight is if you go to the OTF website, and maybe Louise, you can put the link in the chat box. Uh, OTF has launched a new um, a new resource for teachers today. It's, it's Plan Board. It, it's a it's a, a great way for you to organize your lessons and plan your lessons. And OTF has many 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 um, lessons prepared by OTF members. Um, these projects have been done over the last three years. Um, so it's just a wonderful um, resource, and hopefully you'll check it out and um, use it to help you in your planning. So thank you, everyone, and good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Cynthia. I did just throw the plan board uh, link down there, although I just sent you to the home page so that you could follow the steps to, to, to click on the plan board logo that is down towards the bottom of our home page there. Um, and that'll, uh, that'll uh, eliminate any confusion as to how you got there. And uh, thank you all very much. We hope to see you again soon.